Yes, we're all here because we're interested in changing leadership and effective leadership. And before I get into uh, uh, some of uh, my secrets on how we've, we're looking to do that with thousands of leaders, I think the first step is why. What's the big deal? Um, now, it's a question I had to ask, uh, ask people. But what's in your minds when you're talking to managers in your organization about leadership? What do you think they're thinking? It's a fad. You know, if I just politely pay attention, then he's going to go away in a minute and I can get back to selling stuff. Because that's what I do. I can do what really matters. Maybe it's a bit of benign self-interest. I'm going to take something away that might improve a little bit. Um, and I set out to persuade them that it's not a fad that uh, effective leadership is a standard, it's an opportunity, uh, and it's a necessity. And today, it's a necessity. So it's a standard because we're wanting people to reach to do extraordinary things and to be able to do extraordinary things. Um, and I hear very often the, uh, people talking about managers as something that gets in the way of change. How do you get managers to suffer the change, absorb it, uh, make it real for the organization? Your manager should be the asset that you're leveraging for change in your organization. Um, we're all subject to huge change. And I'll come back to that in a moment. An opportunity because um, with leaders, we have the opportunity to make work, which is so important in our lives, more meaningful. It's an opportunity for growth for organizations, growth for individuals. You get leadership right, then it's an opportunity for people to get on. And that's incredibly powerful when an organization starts to get that reputation, that brand, in good people searching you out. And it's a necessity because we're in a massively fast-paced, changing, and most of all, unpredictable world. And the, the pace of change is, uh, is crazy. So I'm just going to go into that in a little bit more, a little bit more detail, just to get that why uh, really solid. If you think about um, uh, the FTSE 100 is 30 years old this year. How many of the original 100 companies are still on it today? It surprised me, it's 30. If you look at the Fortune 500 since the 1970s, 30% of those companies that were there then are still there now. The kinds of companies, kinds of organizations now, the nature of work has changed. It's not about people being repeatable cogs in a process. Um, it's much more about innovation in every business, uh, leveraging technology. You've got the likes of Google and Apple and so on. General Motors now is 200,000 people. Amazon's 100,000 people. Amazon's market cap is four times General Motors. So the world is changing rapidly. So in BT, to bring it back to a real context for me, you get people shrugging inwardly and saying, so what? We're in a situation now where we've had six really good years. The company is worth six times what it was six years ago. People have it in their minds that uh, we're an innovative company. And that's true. We've been around for more than 100 years. If you think about things like the first transatlantic call, the first wireless call, uh, Tommy Flowers, who designed the world's first programmable computer. So people have it in their minds that we innovate. So stuff is changing. We're a technology company. What's the big deal? Well, it is a huge deal. Firstly, because we've been successful over six years through financial control and operational discipline. And you can't continue to grow a company through carving stuff out and making it more efficient. So there's a big challenge. Some of our competitors have also taught us that we won't have a technology business in 10 years unless we become a content business. And so we have to go wholeheartedly into becoming a TV business, a different kind of business. And for a company that is so technically capable, we have not got anywhere near cracking service innovation. So there are a number of threats to the business's survivability. Um, and our senior leaders recognized a couple of years ago, the way it was put is, we've got 
a strategy for growth, but right now we have a culture of survival. We're in a situation for, for 60 years, to make it simple, our product didn't change. And the only choice a customer had was where do you want the hole drilling and maybe what colour do you want? And now, even for a frontline guy, the, the complexity of the things that you might have to sell or the way that things get fixed, we've got broadband, fibre, copper, through your skybox, through UView, do you want TV, not TV? And the importance uh, to consumers, the way they bank and shop, to organisations in health, connecting students and teachers, health practitioners with patients. So the complexity of the business has gone crazy. So we recognise that, but when you're talking, when I'm talking, I remember talking to one senior exec, and he said, well, I get that, and I feel that leadership is, is important, but these are all technical and financial guys. They're saying, what's the plan? I can't. What is culture? How do I measure it? How do we plan to change it? Is it going to take you a year? So we had to turn to think, well, what is the evidence that we have for cultural change? What's important? What's out there? What is uh, the world's best thinking? And what of that applies uh, to us? Um, and we, if you remember, 30 years back, we had um, uh, things like In Search of Excellence, Tom Peters, and some other books like that. They looked at a handful of companies that they felt were excellent and said, what is it that these companies were doing? The researchers on those books revisited a decade later and were very upset to find that, well, if you look now, 25% of those companies are doing really well. 25% of them have disappeared, and the other half are not, over, over the past 30 years, you could not describe them as being the leaders in their segment. So what is it that they'd not grasped? And, and having looked at 600 companies over a much longer time period, um, I said that the companies were too focused on performance, driving performance out, and not focused enough on what they're calling health. So the health of an organisation being, what's its capability to, um, to align, uh, align employees? Uh, does it concentrate on building capability, on renewal? Does it build capability to execute? And it's easy to relate that to human health. You can only drive performance for so long if you're not paying attention to health as well that it's only going to last a certain amount of time. Um, so we're looking at not health or performance, but performance and health to be sustainable in the, long, uh, in the long term. And because there was lots of research over 30 years, there was lots of data to convince uh, a technocratic financial exec in hard numbers that if you do this stuff that you may have thought about as soft and fluffy, you get hard results. You'll double the likelihood of uh, being top quartile on profit, for example. You're more likely to be here. And there's a wealth of data behind that on, so what is it that makes the difference? Now, when looking at health, the evidence shows that it's not about trying to crack everything that can make a company healthy. You have to look at a particular company and say, what are the key things, the key points? And there are some examples there of different companies that have taken this, been subject to this approach or looked at it and they've, they've focused on slightly different things. For us, reviewing what we needed to do, it was very clear that uh, one of those components, leadership and some others, but leadership was absolutely critical to us. It was something that was holding us back. So there's a lot of... We, uh, we, we started to survey thousands of our employees on this stuff because you can check two things. You can say, what practice do you actually see day to day, and you can find out what kind of leadership are people seeing, what are they seeing in relation to customer focus. And also ask, what's your perception of the brand, say, of leadership, which is quite a different thing. So they see their boss doing one thing, and I think Steve mentions this, you were asking, what do they do? It's a much tougher question to say, what do you think BT's leadership is? That's not personal, that's not what I see my boss doing. And it's not uncommon to say, well, my boss is great, but leadership stinks in BT for whatever reason. So the brand, and the brand is valuable. 
If your employees are perceiving that, then that's what's going to be perceived outside. So it maybe wasn't too much of a surprise that there are, there are lots of different leaders in BT. There are some with different styles. And I'm not saying that there's one way of doing leadership that's always important, because leadership is situational. You've got to be able to adapt to the situation. But there was an overriding character, a default in BT, which is what, uh, um, in this framework, is uh, called um, authoritarian leadership, authoritative leadership, which is basically bureaucratic leadership. We are used to command and control. This is the Soviet five-year plan. These are all the things in it. This is the procedure. Carry out the tasks. And the type of leadership that correlates much more powerful as a leading indicator of a healthy company is what they call challenging and supportive leadership, which is about how do you get people to aim higher and own that for themselves? Can you coach them? to improve what's the leaders doing in, in terms of getting people to think for themselves? Do they take away more energy? A lot of people would see that as empowering leadership. So we started to be able to pin down what is this, how do you actually describe this to people, to uh, an executive who think in terms of numbers that there's a game here that's really important, that this is a critical issue to, for the executive committee and the board to get behind and also to be able to start, to be able to measure it, and to be able to say, it's not like this, and I don't want to throw that away. That might be useful sometimes to be command and control, but we need to def shift the default to this. So we're talking about changing the behavior of thousands of leaders. Um, and, when you, and so now I'll start to get into, I think I've dealt with the why, hopefully, into how we uh, trying to get into this. The first thing you do is got to set out a story. You've got to describe this to people. So I just gave a little pen picture of what this kind of leadership is compared to this. So in common with lots of organizations, um, we refreshed our leadership framework. So what are we doing for our stakeholders that we're not good at, that we need to be better at? We had a coaching tool that's developed specific to us in terms of, well, if somebody's not good at that, what might it be inside that's helping, uh, that, that is helping or hindering? But that's not enough to describe it when you're looking at behavioral change. If it was that simple, bringing up kids would be simple, wouldn't it? So you start to get into more examples, real examples. So here's an example I'd used for uh, bureaucratic leadership, somebody following the procedure and following the rules. And the interesting question I put to a, a bunch of senior leaders is, what's the response of the supervisor to seeing that? In, a, in BT, and the response would be, I need to write a new procedure that when somebody's painting the white line and they come across an obstacle, that they need to stop, get out, move it, and then go around it. The real answer is, if somebody understood the outcome and felt empowered to do those things, and not that I've got to be finished this job in two minutes, controller on my backs, then you'd get a better result. So it's a very simple example of people being able to make their own judgments. Um, and I, uh, this chimes for me. I started off um, life in the military, which is maybe why I've ended up in HR. Somebody said to me, I'm not sure what the connection is. But I remember being a very raw uh, uh, officer and, and learning about leadership the hard way. I remember leaping uh, out of a coach one day with 100 troops in, in tow and running off and realizing that I was on my own because I hadn't done anything about letting people know what they were supposed to be doing. Um, and it might be surprising to some people that in the British military, you're trained in what they call mission command. So it's not all command and control. There's a real recognition from hard experience that if you write a really detailed plan and expect people to carry it out by numbers, that plan's gone wrong the moment it starts raining, the train is late, the enemy does something you didn't think about. And apart from that, even today, you can't rely on uh, 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 communication. People are under huge pressure. You can talk about the fog of war. You need small groups of people to know what's the outcome, what's the mission, what's the broad plan. Yes, you have great, highly trained standing operating procedures and routines, but you're expecting very junior people to be able to make high-level judgments and think, uh, and that's what people are trained to do. Otherwise, you lose. So that our shorthand for us 
in trying to get thousands of, of, uh, of managers is challenging leadership. It's about enabling people to aim high. It's about coaching people to succeed and create an energy. So we've described all that stuff so it's done, right? That's all we need to do. That's how. No, people don't change behavior just through a compelling story and an ambition. Um, this is, we found a very useful frame for, to remind, if you're trying to change behavior, what do you have to do? Um, and funnily enough, this is, this is rooted in medical research in the state. So it looked at groups of people with life-threatening conditions and their propensity to take medicine that they have to take or to give up smoking. And people, you get a group of people, even when they know that if they don't change their behavior, be it smoking or taking their drugs every day, they will die. Typically only 10% that knowledge is enough, that strong why is enough to change their behavior. So I found that if you pay attention to these things, so first of all, role modeling. And, and in this example, you know, do, you, do you introduce role models? Do you reinforce? Are people brought back? Do they have a support network? By paying attention to uh, a strong story, fostering conviction, role modeling to, uh, to reinforcement, then the number of people changing their behavior increases to about 70%. I think it was 77% in one study. So it's not there, there's still a quarter of people dying because they didn't change basic behavior. But these are important things to pay attention to. But knowing that meant that we had to look at the wider system. This isn't just about training, which doesn't surprise you. Um, I mentioned measures. We do a health survey once a year. We needed individual leaders to say, how am I, how am I doing and how do I change? So we took the risk of starting to measure leadership. And it's not a science. We had to look at what is it that we measure in terms of engagement, supply of high performers, um, how people deal with uh, performance coaching. What is it that we can measure and put in a basket and then label it gold, silver, and bronze, which just got people being slightly paying more attention to it because we put a badge on it. And you can see the change. This is the change over this year. We're now going to have to reset the bar because we've, uh, by paying attention to it, people have got underneath and started to change what they're paying attention to and prioritize leadership. It's not perfect. People will try and game this the same way they might try and game their sales targets. But data in our organization is extremely useful. So that's part of reinforcing and knowing mechanics aren't enough. When you're looking at, I talked about aiming high, creating energy, we've had to look at our structures. In some places, we've got 20 layers of decision making, top to bottom. There aren't really 20 layers of decision making in BT. There are probably eight or nine different levels of accountability. So we've had to look very hard at how we give people roles that are big enough that they have clear accountability to be able to work in this way. At the other extreme, we're looking at our talent and succession systems. And are they really reinforcing the kind of empowered environment? Are they giving people opportunity to get on in the way that we're describing? So if they're just examples, I've had to look at the whole system in are we really reinforcing challenging uh, leadership or are, or, or are we exhorting people to do one thing and then the, uh, even if they really get it and go back on a Monday to change, the whole system just undermines them. So I'm just going to go into the, all of that, still not enough. To get the pace that we needed, we had to come back to interventions. Uh, development interventions. Um, and you're probably in this room, you know as, as well as me, that training is often latched on as the answer when it's not really the answer. But in this case, it has been a critical part of the answer. So I just want to outline what we did and why. Um, there are three ways of looking at this uh, overview. The first is, it's all relate. the first frame is, it's related back to that influence model I talked to you about. So the way we did training for example, reinforce role modeling. So we had to start with the executive committee and the board. So they got these interventions first. And when they'd done that, they taught alongside uh, experts that we brought in to the next layer down and reinforced. Um, 
A second point was the story, the purpose of the organisation, is a critical part that we reinforce all the time. We bring leaders in to, to talk that through. So we're constantly connecting what we're trying to achieve, what the organisation achieves for all its stakeholders, for society as well as shareholders and for employees, we're connecting that up to how people are thinking and what we're trying to do with leadership. Um, we, we also needed to, them to take this work out and we wanted them to teach in groups in their teams some of the concepts that we were taking out. Partly to improve the speed of Cascade and partly because if you know that that's the ask, it makes you think really carefully about doing things and it's part of the sustained mechanism. So it meant that I had to turn some of our leaders into faculty, which is a very powerful message for how seriously we're taking leadership. Another frame to look at this is that we were very clear of how adults learn in going about this. People learn if you give them, first of all, a powerful insight, an aha moment. So we had to look at what's the world's best thinking and how do we bring it in. And if we need to bring a professor from Harvard in to go through a particular point, then we brought a professor from Harvard in to go through that point. Once you've done that, people need time to reflect. They need to make it real. So there's a lot of working in small groups on this. And there's a lot of practice. So we can't change <coughs> skills and behaviours without practice. So thousands of leaders have become very good at what they do, very successful, by behaving in a particular way. And all of a sudden, we're asking them to behave in a different way. So first of all, that's a, that's a habit to change. It's not easy to change habits. It needs practice. It's also threatening, which I'll come back to in a moment. So there's that practice and then taking it to action. So the way this is designed, there is plenary, but there's an awful lot of working in small groups. And to do that, to take it seriously, we had to create an internal facilitation and coaching. So we have people who have day jobs elsewhere, who, who we have accredited and have used this process to learn how to facilitate this process. And then I have a cohort of people that we can use to execute change and to coach and do follow-on coaching and validation of skills from senior leaders through. So this process looks slightly different for different groups of managers but we're looking at the moment to drive that. We're about halfway through driving it through a management population of about 12,000, and I have another 30,000 individual contributors, people who lead on projects, who are experts in certain things that we need to reach as well. I touched on that other insight, that it's, it's what are the barriers inside people to change? And this goes back to my medical example. The 25% who still didn't change, even when you supported them and role modeled and so on. It's not enough to role model on its own. People just think it's the boss is role modeling this stuff, but that's what the chief exec does. When I'm the chief exec, I'll, I'll speak like that and role model that. Right now, I know how to get things done. But I'm talking about this being physically threatening. When we got into some of these sessions and say, what is it that stops you from empowering? There was a fear of change. So the way this is structured on self at the beginning, we have some purposefully powerful work on there to get people to get inside. And what is the hidden thing that they're not even aware of that is playing away that's making them immune to change, things that are protecting them from change? So for example, with being empowered, People feel that that is a loss of control. If I'm telling people what to do and I've got a grip and I'm into the detail, then I know that I'm on top of it. I'm the expert, I'm the boss, and I'm controlling all these things. That's how I've become successful. We're very powerfully driven by our social connections, by our sense of control. It's how we've evolved and become successful. We're social creatures. And threatening that is as powerful as threatening to starve somebody or threatening them with a knife in the reaction. So find that people were fearful at the core without realizing it, and it didn't matter if they were convinced they needed to change and they berate themselves. This isn't a technical change, this behavioral change. It's an adaptive change. And you have to help people understand what's the fear that's protecting me? What is it that's playing inside that I'm not even aware of that's stopping me from doing this? Because it's protecting me, it's making me immune from doing this because it's dangerous to change my behavior. I might not be successful. I might lose control. 
And then it's putting some infrastructure around and having to show people when you empower, it's not just about changing your behavior, but you have to think through, well, how do I focus people on outcomes? Are my routines and the basics of how we get done, are they strong enough that people won't, they, they will if I say these are the outcomes you want, I just, I don't want you to focus on fixing this light bulb, but you now own this piece of plant and think, th think through how you're going to keep it reliable. If you've got that outcome, do they have the tools to be able to carry that out? So progress and momentum. We've seen, uh, we're now, and I have this year's results as well, and it's very interesting. We're seeing the practice, the perceptions of practice, what people see happening, change right across the organisation. It's not surprising where we took, touched the top 100 and then 600 and we're into the next 700 big uh, managers at the moment. It's not surprising that their teams see the biggest change and it gets weaker as you go down. But the whole organisation has sensed is seeing a change in practice. So we're seeing that start to change. There's a long way to go. Uh, but in the senior team, it's gone from third quartile to top quartile over two years. It's interesting that the, the perception of leadership at BT, our reputation hasn't changed at all yet. It takes a long time to change people's perceptions. Even when they see things different, people say, well, just because I'm seeing it different, I don't trust that this is long term. It might be a flash in the pan. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's happening everywhere else. So this is something we're having to think really carefully about. How do we sustain? How do we reinforce in everything that we're doing about challenging leadership? It's uh, reinforced that we need to reach and touch everybody somehow, cost effectively. Um, but the health in the organization is improving. So this is probably, if we've been at it two years, we're now planning out what are the next three years. When I first talked to the group chief exec, he wanted results in a year. And now we're into an understanding that this is a five or six year journey to build in the, um, the reaction, the normal way that people work, that they behave differently. But there's a recognition if we don't do that, we won't be innovative, we won't be agile enough, we won't, uh, we won't achieve what we need to achieve and we won't grow.